the Mercury Theater on the air. No theatrical organization has done more in recent years to stimulate interest in the American stage than the Mercury Theater, whose outstanding productions of last winter under the direction of Orson Welles were the sensation of the theatrical season. Julius Caesar in Modern Dress, The Shoemaker's Holiday, Mark Blitzstein's The Cradle Will Rock, Bernard Shaw's Heartbreak House, proved to the public the vitality and genius of this new organization. This summer, the Columbia Network introduced Orson Welles and his company for the first time to radio. And tonight we present the Mercury Theater on the air in the fifth broadcast of its unique new series, Dramatizing Famous Narratives by Great Authors. CBS again welcomes Mr. Wells and his associates to Columbia stations and to the stations of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And here is Orson Wells to tell you about these stories himself. Mr. Wells. Good evening. Tonight, as you were duly warned last week, we are trying out something altogether new. We're telling three stories instead of one. Three short stories instead of a single long one. Stories about love and ghosts and horse races. Three stories in the first person singular about young people for grown-ups. I'm a Fool by Sherwood Anderson is the first of the three. <laughs> It began at 3 o'clock one October afternoon. As I sat in the grandstand, the fall trotting and pacing neat Sandusky, Ohio. It was a good hot jolt for me, and it all came about through my own foolishness, too. The summer before, I'd left my hometown with a fellow called Bert French with two horses that was campaigning through the race meets that year. Gee, it was fun. We had Bucephalus, a big black pacing stallion that could do 209 or 210 if he had to and a little gelding called Dr. Fritz that never lost a race all fall when Bert wanted him to win. Gee whiz, it was fun. We got to a county seat town, maybe say on a Saturday or Sunday, and the fair began the next Tuesday, and you took your horses to the track and fed them and got your good clothes out of a box and put them on, and the town was full of farmers gaping because they could see you were horse race people, and you went into a saloon, the two of you, Bert and I, and all the dudes came and stood around asking questions, and all you did was to lie and lie all you could about what horses you had. And I said I owned them. And then some fellow would ask us to have a drink of whiskey with him. And Bert would lead him on. <laughs> uh, what was that you said, sir? I asked you, gentlemen, if you'd have a drink with me. Oh, well, all right. I'm agreeable to a little nip. Tell you what I'll do, sir. I'll split a quart with you. <laughs> all right. Gee whiz. That isn't what I want to tell my story about. We got home late November, and I promised Mother I'd quit the races for good. There's a lot of things you got to promise a mother because she don't know any better. I got a job driving a laundry van, and then, as I started to tell you, the fall race came to Sandusky. I got the day off, and I went. Had on my good clothes and my new bound derby hat and a stand-up collar. And I had $40 in my pocket and three twenty-five cent cigars and a drink of whiskey inside me that was bought me at the West House by a fellow with a cane and a... Windsor tie. Gee, it was fun being on a track again. I looked around for Bert French, and there he was standing around with his horses. Hello, Bert. Why, hello, Joe. How you been, Bert? Never better. See, so you got any money, Joe? Sure. How'd you like to watch it grow? Like it's fine, Bert. All right, come over here then. I'll tell you something. Listen, Joe. In the second race, the 218 pace, there's a horse I'm handling, Abdul Ben Hammond. There he is, number seven. That gelding's as fast as street, Joe. Belongs to a fellow called Mather in Marietta, Ohio. We got him marked at 221, but he can step in 08. Gee. In the first heat, don't you touch him. He'll go around like an oxen hitched to a plow. After that, you go right down and lay on your pile. Well, thanks, Bert, a lot. Have a cigar? Well, thanks, Joe. Well, 
Well, sir, I went and bought myself the best seat I could get right in the grandstand. I didn't go in for any of those boxes. Well, that's putting on too many ears. Well, right in front of me in the grandstand that day, right in front there was a fellow with a couple of girls. And they was about my age. The young fellow was a nice guy, all right. He had his sister with him and another girl, and the sister looked around over his shoulder accidentally at first, not intending to start anything. She wasn't that kind. And her eyes and mine happened to meet. You know how it is. Gee, she was a peach. She had on a soft dress, kind of blue stuff, and I blushed when she looked right at me, and so did she. She was the nicest girl I ever seen in my life. She wasn't stuck on herself. She could talk, you know, proper grammar without being like a school teacher or something like that. But what I mean is, she was okay. And then, pretty soon the horses came out for the 218 pace, and there was Bert's horse in among the rest. What do we bet on this time? What do you say? You know as much about it as I do. What about the brown one there with the long tail? Hank, ma'am, that mare couldn't beat a streetcar. Well, they looked up kind of surprised. But they didn't seem mad. And anyway, I'd done it now, and I might as well go on. There's a horse in this race, number seven, that's as fast as streak. Abdul Ben Hamid. Is that a horse's name? That's right. Abdul Ben Hamid. But look, don't you go letting on this first heat, because... Don't bet on him, because he'll, he'll pace it like a lame cow. You see if he don't. But when the first heat is over, go right down lay a pile on Andrew Ben Hammett. He'll come right out and skin him alive. Will he really? That's the dope. Well, that's what I told her. Gee, you should have seen the way they looked at me. And then you know what she did? Gee whiz. She asked this man that was with her, Wilbur. Well, she asked him, and there was a fat man sitting beside the little girl that had looked at me twice by this time. And I had heard both blushing and... What did that young fella do but have the nerve to turn and ask the fat man to get up and change places with me so I could set with his crowd? I want you to meet Miss Eleanor Woodbury. Pleased to meet you. And this is my sister, Lucy Wilson. My name's Wilbur. I suppose it was their having such swell names. Got me off my trolley and then that girl. You know how a fella is that something that kind of nice clothes and the kind of nice eyes she had and the way she looked at me a while before over her brother's shoulder and me looking back at her and both of us blushing. I couldn't show up for a boob, could I? I I made a fool of myself, that's what I did. Glad to know you all. My name's Walter Mathis. How do you do, Mr. Mathis? From Marietta, Ohio. Have a cigar, Wilbur? Thanks. And do you really think this horse is going to win, Mr. Mathis? (laughs) Then I told him all the smashingest lie you ever heard. I said my father owned this horse. You know, Boob and Adam. It was supposed to be a secret because our family was proud and... Never gone in for racing that way. After Ben Hammett, I mean. Here's what I think of that horse, Wilbur. Will you do me the favor when you go down to place these 30 bills on After Ben Hammett at whatever odds you can get? Just about then, the bell for the first heat come off. And sure enough, After Ben Hammett went off his stride up the back stretch and looked like a wooden horse or a sick one came in to be last. See, folks, what I tell you? Like a lame cow. You certainly were right, Mr. Mason. Then this Wilmer West and went down to the betting place under the grandstand and this Miss Woodbury with him, and and Lucy Weston and I was left alone together, like on a desert island. Hey, now, 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 Hey, It's on a hill, a uh, great old red brick house with the stables behind it, way up on a hill, up above the Ohio River. I like rivers. Her eyes were shining, and then she kind of, with her shoulder, you know, kind of touched me. Not just tucking down, I, I don't mean that. You know how a woman can do. They get close, but not getting gay either. You know what they do. Gee whiz, I begin to wish I was on the square with her and to see what a fool I'd been, but they're... Wasn't any way of getting myself on the square now. There ain't any Walter Mathers, like I said to her, and there ain't ever been one, but if there was, I bet I'd go to Marietta, Ohio, and shoot him tomorrow. And then Wilbur Weston came back with Miss Woodbury, and he'd gone and bet $50 on his horse, and the girls had gone and put in $10 each of their own money, too. Gee, I was sick then, but came out okay. 
Then Adam stepped the next tree, leaped like a bush with spoiled eggs, going to market before they could be found out. There he goes! Look at him, Mr. Mathis. Look at him coming up. Uncle Ben Hammond. Uncle Ben Hammond. Oh, he's done. There he is. Coming up. Uncle Ben Hammond. Second, oh, Mr. Mathis. He's going to win. He's going to win. Well, we all got nine to two for our money. After the race, we had a hack downtown, and Wilbur stood us a swell supper at the West House and a bottle of champagne besides, and there was I with that girl, big boot that I am. But she wasn't saying much, and I wasn't saying much either. One thing I know, she wasn't stuck on me because of the lie about my father being rich and all that. There w- There's a way, you know. Crap some money. There's a kind of girl you see just once in your life and you don't get busy and make hay, then you're gone for good and all you might just as well go jump off a bridge because what it means is you want that girl to be your wife and you want nice things around her like nice flowers and swell clothes and you want her to have the kids you're going to have. You want good music played and not ragtime. Gee whiz. Well, there's a place over near Sandusky across a kind of bay and it's called Cedar Point and after we'd had supper we went over to it in a launch... Just the four of us. By ourselves. What time does that train leave, Wilbur? 10.40. And is that the last train? Yeah. That's the last train. Oh, sure. Well, over at Cedar Point, we didn't stay around where there was a gang of common cattle at all. There was a big dance halls and dining places for yaps, and there was a... A beach you could walk along and get where it was dark. We went there. She didn't talk hardly at all. And neither did I. I was thinking how glad I was my mother was all right. Always made us kids learn to eat with a fork at table and not spill soup and not be noisy and rough like a gang you see around a racetrack, you know, that way. Hey, Lucy! Lucy, we're going up to meet you, Wayne. Are you coming? Go on ahead. We'll wait for you here. I feel kind of tired, don't you? Hmm. Yeah. I guess so, Miss Lucy. Why don't we sit down a while? It's nice here. Lucy and I sat down in a dark place where there was some roots, old trees, and the water had washed up. Feel that wood, how smooth it is. It's like silk. Yeah. And there was a watery smell. And the night was like... As if you could put your hand out and feel it. So warm. And soft and dark. And sweet. Like an orange. After that... The time till we had to go back in the lodge and they had to catch their train... Was nothing at all. It went like winking your eyes. Lucy! I've got to go. We've got to go to the train now. Will you kiss me goodbye? She was most crying then. But she never knew nothing I knew. She couldn't be so busted up as I was. Gee whiz. Sometimes I hope I have cancer and die. Guess you know what I mean. We went in the launch across the bay to the train like that. And it was dark, too. What are you thinking about? She what? Only she knew. You know what I was thinking? What? I was thinking you and I could get out of this boat right this minute and walk on the water. Sounded foolish, all right. But I, but I knew what she meant. Quick, we were right at the depot. There was a big gang of yaps crowded milling around like cattle, and how could I tell her? It won't be long because you'll write and I'll answer you. I ain't got a chance like a hay barn a fire, a swell chance I got to answer her. Oh, 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 oh. 
Five, three, three, COVID, Kiffin, all aboard. Yeah, and maybe she'd write me down at Marietta that way and the letter would come back. And stamped on the front of it by the USA. There ain't any such guy. Or something like that. Whatever they stamp on a letter that way. All aboard! Bye, Walter. Thanks for the tip off. Bye. Goodbye. 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 that train went, I busted out and cried like a kid. Gee, I could have run after that train and made man of war look like a freight train after a wreck, but socks are mighty. What's the use? Did you ever see such a fool? Me trying to pass myself off for a big bug and a swell. To her. Did you ever see such a fool? I bet you would. If I had an arm broke right now or a train had run over my foot, I wouldn't go to no doctor at all. I'd go sit down, let it hurt and hurt. That's what I'd do, big fool that I am. I'll bet you what. I bet you if I hadn't drunk that booze, i never been such a boob as to go tell such a lie. A lie that couldn't ever be made straight to a lady like her. I wish I had that fellow right here that bought me that drink. I'd smash him for fair gosh darn his eyes. He's a big fool. That's what he is. If I'm not another, you just go and find me one and I'll quit working and be a bum. Give him my job. I don't care for working and earning and saving it for no such boob as myself. The second story of tonight's program by Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater is The Open Window by Saki. <coughs> My name is Frampton Nutto. <coughs> I am a very nervous man. The doctors are not entirely in agreement in the matter of my diet. They have agreed to a man in ordering me complete rest, an absence of mental excitement, an avoidance of anything in the nature of violent physical exercise. It was the doctor's idea that I should go to the country for a week for my health. But it was my sister, <clears throat> Matilda Nuttall, who insisted on Mole Barrington. I know how it'll be, Frampton. You will bury yourself down there and not speak to a living soul. And your nerves will be worse than ever from moping. I'm not given to moping, Matilda. Oh, yes, you are, Frampton. I shall give you letters to all the people I know in Mole Barrington. Some of them, as far as I can remember, are quite nice. You will call on them. That is how I came to visit Mrs. Sappleton. Hello. I would like to see Mrs. Sappleton. My name is <coughs> Frampton Nuttall. Really? I have a letter to Mrs. Sappleton from my sister. <clears throat> I see. Won't you come in and sit down? I was led into the drawing room by a young lady of about 15 with unnaturally long legs, a great many freckles on her face, and gray eyes. I'll tell my aunt you're here. What did you say your name was? Nuttall. Frampton Nuttall. I'll tell my aunt, Mr. Nuttall. I wondered whether Mrs. Sappleton was in the married or widowed state. An indefinable something about the room seemed to suggest masculine habitation. A large French window opened on the garden. Through it I could see a well-kept lawn. And beyond that, the darker green of the fens. The scene was delightfully peaceful. I'm sorry, Mr. Nuttall. My aunt will be down presently. In the meantime, you must try and put up with me. Oh. Yes. Mr. Nuttall? Yes? Do you know many of the people around here? Not a soul. My sister was staying here at the rectory, you know, some four years ago, and she gave me letters of introduction to some of the people here. Then you know practically nothing about my aunt, Mr. Nuttall? Only her name and address. Oh. My aunt's great tragedy happened just three years ago. Three years ago. That would be since your sister's day. Her tragedy? Yes. 
We try not to talk about it. You may wonder why we keep that window open on an October afternoon. Why, it's quite warm for the time of year. That's not why we keep it open, Mr. Miller. It uh, hasn't anything to do with the uh, tragedy, has it? Yes, it has, Mr. Neville. Out through that window, three years ago today, my aunt's husband and her two young brothers went off for their day's shooting. They never came back. In crossing the moor to their favorite snipe shooting ground, they were all three engulfed in a treacherous piece of fog. It had been that dreadful wet summer, you know. And places that were safe in other years gave way suddenly without warning. Their bodies were never recovered. That was the dreadful part of it. Oh. Poor aunt always thinks they'll come back someday. They and the little brown spaniel that was lost with them. And walk in at that window just as they used to do. That is why the window's kept open every evening. Till it is quite dusk. Oh. Poor dear aunt. She often told me how they went out. Her husband with his white waterproof coat over his arm. And Ronnie, her youngest brother, singing, Bertie, Bertie, why do you bound like this? I said, Bertie, why do you bound? As he always did to tease her. Because she said it got on her nerves. Do you know, sometimes on still, quiet evenings like this, I almost get a creepy feeling that they'll all walk in through that window. It was a relief when Mrs. Sappleton came into the room. Oh, I'm so sorry to have kept you waiting, Mr. Nuttall. I do hope Vera has been amusing you. She has been very interesting. It's so nice of you to come and see us, Mr. Nuttall. I do hope you don't mind the open window. Why, uh, no, I... No. Open window? No. My husband and brothers will be home directly from hunting, and they always come in this way. They've been out for snipe in the marshes today, so they make a fine mess over my poor carpet. So like you men folk, isn't it? Do you hunt, Mr. Nuttall? It was horrible the way the poor woman's mind dwelt on the topic of hunting. I looked up and the girl's eyes caught mine. She shook her head sadly. I tried desperately to change the subject. I told her that I was in Mole Barrington for my health. But I was conscious that Mrs. Sappleton was giving me only a fraction of her attention, and her eyes were constantly staring past me to the open window and the lawn beyond. Then, suddenly, I saw her stiffen. She was staring at the window. Here oh. they are. Here they are now, just in time for tea. I turned toward the niece. The child was staring through the open window with dazed horror in her eyes. I turned and looked in the same direction. In the deepening twilight, three figures were walking across the lawn toward the window. They all carried guns under their arms, and one of them carried a white waterproof coat hung over his shoulders. A tired brown spaniel kept close at their heels. Noiselessly, they... they near the house. Oh, good heavens. Oh, good heavens! Help! 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 Lucy, who on earth was that bolted off the drive as we came in? That was Mr. Nuttall. I can't imagine what came over him. I expect it was a spaniel that did it. Mr. Nuttall told me he had a horror of dogs. Vera? Yes, Aunt Lucy. Vera, what did you say to Mr. Nuttall before I came into the room? Nothing, Aunt Lucy. Mr. Nuttall did all the talking. I didn't say anything. He told me the strangest thing. He was once hunted into a cemetery somewhere on the banks of the Ganges by a pack of pariah dogs and had to spend the night in a newly dug grave with the creature snarling and grinning and foaming just above his head. Enough to make anyone lose their nerve on it. You are listening to the Columbia Network's presentation of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater in three famous short stories. You have just heard the first two of these. I'm a Fool and the Open Window. We will present the third story in a moment. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. 
The Columbia Network is presenting three famous short stories. And now the Mercury Theater and Orson Welles resume with My Little Boy by Carl Ewald. his way through the world, looks at everything that there is to look at and bites at every apple, both those that are his due and those which are forbidden him. He is not a pretty child, but he is charming. His face can light up suddenly and become radiant. He can look at you with quite cold eyes. He has a strong intuition, and he is incorruptible. He has never yet bartered a kiss for candy. He has bad habits, too. He is apt, for instance, suddenly and without the slightest reason to go up to people whom he meets in the street and hit them with his little stick. What is in his mind when he does so, I do not know. And so long as he does not hit me, it remains a matter between himself and the people concerned. He has an odd trick of seizing his words in a grown-up conversation, storing them for a while, and then asking me for an explanation. Father? Yes? What is life? <laughs> I give him a tap on his little stomach and roll him over on the carpet and conceal my emotion under a mighty tuzzle. Later, when we're sitting together, breathless and tired, I give him his answer. Life is delightful, my little boy. Don't you be afraid of it. My little boy is given a penny by Mary the cook with instructions to go to the baker's and buy some biscuits. I stand at my window and see him cross the street in his slow way and with bent head. Only he goes slower than usual with his head bent more deeply between his small shoulders. He stands long outside the baker's window where there is a confused heap of lollipops and chocolates and sugar sticks. Then he lifts his hand, opens the door, disappears, and presently returns with a paper bag, eating with all his might. And I, who heaven be praised of myself, been a thief in my time, go all over the house and give my orders. My little boy enters the kitchen. Put the biscuits on the table. He stands still for a moment and looks at Mary and at the table and at the floor. Then he goes into the living room where his mother is sitting. You're quite a big boy now that you can buy biscuits for Mary. His face is very long. He says nothing. He comes quietly to me, sits on the edge of a chair. Hello. Hello. You've been over the way at the baker's. What did you buy at the baker's? Lollipops. Oh, well, I never. What fun. I had some lollipops this morning. Who gave you the money this time? Mary. Really? Well, Mary is certainly fond of you, isn't she? Remember the lovely ball she gave you for your birthday? Father. Mary told me to buy a penny's worth of biscuits. <laughs> oh, dear. It's very quiet in the room. My little boy cries bitterly, and I look anxiously before me and stroke his hair. Well, you fooled Mary badly. She needs those biscuits, of course, for her cooking. She thinks they're on the kitchen table, and when she goes to look, she won't find any. Mother gave her a penny for biscuits. Mary gave you a penny for biscuits. And you go and spend it on lollipops. What are we going to do? If only we had a penny, then you could rush across the street and fetch the biscuits. Father, there's a penny on Mother's writing table. Oh, is there really? Oh, no, I'm afraid that's no use to us, my little boy. 
That penny belongs to Mother. The other was Mary's. People are so terribly fond of their money and get so angry when you take it from them. I can understand that, for you can buy such an awful lot of things with money. You can get biscuits and lollipops and toys and clothes and half the things in the world. And it's not so easy to make money, either. Now, Mary, she has to spend the whole day cleaning rooms and cooking dinner and washing up before she gets her wages. And out of that, she has to buy clothes and shoes... And you know she has a little girl whom she has to pay for at Mrs. Olson's. She must certainly have saved very cleverly before she managed to buy you that ball for your birthday. Father, haven't you got a penny? Mm, here's my purse. Look for yourself. Not a penny in it. Spent the last this morning. We walk up and down. We sit down and get up and walk about again. We're very gloomy. We're bowed down with sorrow and look at each other with great perplexity. Hmm, there might be one hidden away in a drawer somewhere. Yes. Hmm. Only if only we could find a penny. Oh, here's one. Hurry, look, Father. A penny. Hooray. It's a penny. Hurry now. You go this way through my door. Then run back quickly up the kitchen stairs with the biscuits and put them on the table. I'll call Mary so that she doesn't see. We won't tell anybody. He's down the stairs before I've done talking. I run after him. Hey there. Hey, wasn't it a splendid thing we found that penny? Oh, yes, yes. And he laughs for happiness. And I laugh, too. His legs go like drumsticks across to the baker's. From my window, I see him come back, running with red cheeks and glad eyes. He's committed his first crime. He's understood it. He has not the sting of remorse in his soul nor the black badge of forgiveness on his cap. The mother of my little boy and I sit until late at night talking about money, which seems to us the most difficult matter of all. For our little boy must learn to know the power of money and the glamour of money and the joy of money. He must earn much money and spend much money. Yet there were two people yesterday who killed a man to rob him of four dollars and thirty-seven cents. My little boy is engaged to be married. She's a big, large-limbed young woman, three years his senior. Her name is Gertie. By a misunderstanding, however, which is pardonable at his age and, moreover, quite explained by Gertie's appearance, he calls her Dirty. Little Dirty, and by this name she will be handed down to history. I want a girl for myself. Quite right, my boy. Either I know very little of mankind or he has made a fortunate choice. No one is likely to take Dirty from him. Like the gentleman that he is, he at once brings the girl home to us and introduces her. Owing to the formality of the occasion, he does not go by the kitchen way as usual, but rings the front doorbell. I open the door myself. There he stands on the mat, hat in hand, with Dirty, his bride, and with radiant eyes. Father, this is little Dirty. She's my sweetheart. We're going to be married. Mm, that's what people usually do with their sweethearts. Come in, Dirty, and be welcomed by the family. Wipe your feet, Dirty. The mother of my little boy doesn't think much of the match. Why, she's a perfectly dreadful little thing. I have a good mind not to let her in the house. We can't do that. I'm not in ecstasies over her either, but it's not at all certain that it will last. Yes, but... Do you remember what little use it was when your mother forbade me the house? <laughs> we used to meet in the most incredible places and kiss each other terribly. I can quite understand that you've forgotten, but... You ought to bear it in mind now that your son's beginning. My dear. Besides, I must remind you that it is spring. And so dirty is accepted. But when she calls, she is first to undergo a short quarantine while the mother of my little boy washes her and combs her hair thoroughly. Dirty doesn't like this, but the boy does. He looks on with extraordinary eagerness. No, no. Look, mother, look. There. There's a place you haven't washed. There's a good deal of cruelty in love. 
he himself hates to be washed, or perhaps it is merely his sense of duty. Last Friday, in cold blood, he allowed Dirty to wait outside on the step for half an hour until his mother came home. Another of his joys is to see Dirty eat. I can quite understand that. Here is something worth looking at. The mother of my little boy and I would be glad, too, to watch her if there were any chance of giving Dirty her fill. But there is none. At least not with my income. When I see all that food disappear without as much as a shade of satisfaction coming into her eyes, I tremble for the young couple's future. But he is cheerful and unconcerned. My little boy and I have had a very interesting walk in the park. There was a mouse which was irresistible. There were two sparrows, husband and wife, who built their nest right before our eyes, and a snail which had no secrets for us. And there were flowers, yellow and white, and green leaves, which told us the oddest adventures. Now we are sitting on a bench, digesting our impressions. What was that? Oh, that was the lion in the zoo. What's the zoo, Father? The zoo, my boy, is a horrid place where they lock up wild beasts who've done no wrong. Animals who are accustomed to walk about freely in far-off countries where they come from. The lion is there. You just heard him roaring. He's so strong that he can kill a policeman with one blow of his paw. He has great haughty eyes and awfully sharp teeth. They caught him one day in a trap, tied him with ropes and dragged him here and locked him in a cage with iron bars to it. The cage is about half the size of the kitchen at home. And there the king walks up and down, up and down, and gnashes his teeth with sorrow and rage and roars so that you can hear him miles away. And outside his cage stand curious people who laugh at him because he can't get out and eat them up and poke their sticks through the rails and tease him. Would he eat them up if he got out? In a moment. He can't get out, can he, Father? No. That's awfully sad. He can't get out. Well, Father, let's go and look at the lion. I pretend not to hear. And go on to tell him of the strange birds there. Great eagles that used to fly over church steeples and over the highest trees and mountains. Now they are sitting in cages on a perch like canaries with clipped wings and blind eyes. I tell him of gulls which used to fly all day long over the stormy sea. Now they splash about in a puddle of water, screaming pitifully. I tell him of wonderful blue and red birds which in their youth used to live among wonderful red and blue flowers in forests a thousand times bigger than this park. Now they sit there in very small cages and hang their beaks while they stare at tiresome boys in dark blue suits and black stockings and rubbers and sailor hats. Are these birds really blue? Sky blue and utterly broken-hearted. Father, can't we go and look at the birds? I don't think we will. Why should more silly boys go and look at them? You can't imagine how it goes to one's heart to look at those poor captive birds. Father, I should so much like to go to the zoo. Take my advice and don't. The animals there are not the real animals you see. They are ill and ugly and angry because of their captivity and their longing and their pain. But I should like so much to see them. Now, let me tell you something. To go to the zoo costs Five cents for you and ten cents for me. That makes fifteen cents altogether. That's an awful lot of money. We won't go there now, but we'll buy the biggest money box we can find. One of those money boxes shaped like a pig. Then we'll put fifteen cents in it, and every Thursday we'll put fifteen cents in the pig. By and by, that'll grow to be quite a fortune. Such a fortune that when you're grown up, you can take a trip to Africa yourself and to the desert... And hear the wild, the real lion roaring and tremble just like the people tremble down there. Father, I'd rather go to the zoo now. Shall we go and have some ice cream at Justice? I'd rather go to the zoo. You're not going to the zoo. Now we'll go home. And home we go, but we're not in a good temper. Of course, I get over it and buy him an enormous money box pig. We put the money into it, and he thinks that most interesting. But later in the afternoon, 
I find him in the nursery, engaged in a piteous game. He has built a cage in which he has imprisoned the pig. He is teasing it and hitting it with his whip. You can't get out and bite me, you stupid pig. You can't get out, do you hear? You can't get out. You can't get out. <laughs> is paying us a visit. And my little boy is sitting at her feet. She has buried her fingers in her hair and is reading. Reading, reading. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Nor his manservant, nor his maidservant. The boy watches her with tender compassion. Then he comes to me. Father, must dirty do all the Ten Commandments say? Yes. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Father, when I grow big, must I do all the Ten Commandments say? Yes. Father, do you do all the Ten Commandments say? Yes. Well, Father, I don't believe that I can do all those things that the Ten Commandments say. There is a great hullabaloo among the children in the courtyard. I hear them shouting something, and I go to the window and see my little boy in the front rank of the ruffians screaming, fighting with clenched fists, without his cap. I know that he'll come up before long and tell me about it. Presently appears. He stands still, as is his way by my side. Does nothing. I steal a glance at him. He's greatly excited and proud and glad like one who has fearlessly done his duty. Well, what fun you've been having down there. Oh, it was a Jewish boy we were beating up. What? A Jewish boy? You beating him up? Yes. What had he done? Nothing. He seems puzzled. I look so queer suddenly. Now I snatch my hat and run out of the door as fast as I can. Come, come. We must find this Jewish boy and beg his pardon. My little boy hurries after me. He does not understand a word of it, but he is terribly in earnest. What's his name? Nathan. Nathan? Nathan? There's nobody in the courtyard. We go out in the street. Nathan! All in vain. The Jewish boy and his persecutors are blown away into space. So we go and sit up in my room again. Well, nothing to be done now. Hope you'll meet that Jewish boy someday so that you can give him your hand and ask him to forgive you. You must tell him that you did it only because you were stupid. But if another time anyone does him any harm, I hope you'll go in and help him and beat up the other fellow as long as you can move a limb. Yes, I can see by my little boy's face that he is ready to do what I wish. So now I have to explain. Now let me tell you. The Jews are by way of being quite a wonderful people. You remember David about whom Dirty reads at school? He was a Jewish boy. And the child Jesus, whom everybody worships and loves. Although he died 2,000 years ago. He was a Jew, too. My little boy stands with his arms on my knee. Now, the old Hebrews rise before us in all their splendor and power. They ride on their camels in coats of many colors and with long beards. Moses and Joseph and his brethren and Samson and David and Saul. We hear wonderful stories. The walls of Jericho fall at the sound of the trumpet. 
So what next? Go on, Father, go on. The whole day is devoted to Jews. We learn that many of the most famous men in the world are Jews. And when evening comes, and Mother sits down at the piano and sings the song which Father loves above all other songs, it appears that the words were written by one Jew and the melody composed by another. My little boy is hot and red when he falls asleep that night. He turns restlessly in his bed and talks in his sleep. He's a little feverish tonight. We're spending the summer in the country. A long way out where the real country is. Cows and horses, pigs and sheep, a beautiful dog and hens and ducks form our circle of acquaintances. The sun burns us. We eat like farmhands, sleep like guinea pigs and wake like larks. Presently, for better or worse, we get neighbors. They're regular city people. The pearl of the family is Erna. Erna is five years old. Her very small face is pale green, with watery blue eyes and yellow curls. She is richly and gaily dressed in a broad and slovenly sash, a daintily embroidered dress, short openwork socks, and patent leather shoes. I at once perceived that my little boy's eyes have seen a woman. Altogether, there's no doubt as to the condition of his heart. One morning, he proposes. He's sitting with his beloved on the lawn. Close to them, her aunt is nursing her rheumatism under a red parasol. Up in the balcony above, I sit, like Providence, and see everything, myself unseen. Anna? You shall be my sweetheart. I have a sweetheart already at home. Her name is Dirty. This communication naturally by no means lowers Erna's suitor in her eyes, but it immediately rouses all Auntie's moral instincts. If you have a sweetheart, you must be true to her. But Erna's going to be my sweetheart. Listen, child, you're a very naughty boy. If you have given this, uh, uh, Dirty. That's an extraordinary name. But if you've given her your word, you must keep it till you die. Otherwise, you'll never, never be happy. My little boy understands not a word and answers not a word, but later, after lunch, he comes up to where his mother and I are sitting, puts his hands in his pockets, looks straight before him. Father, can't you have two sweethearts? The question comes quite unexpectedly. At the moment, I don't know what to answer. Well? I... uh, Pull my waistcoat down and my collar up. Yes. Yes, you you can have two sweethearts. Uh, But it is wrong. It leads to more fuss and unpleasantness than you can possibly imagine. Are you so fond of Erna? Yes. Do you want to marry her? Yes. Well, then, the thing is settled. We'll write to Dirty and give her notice. Well, there's nothing else to be done. I'll write now, and you can give the letter yourself to the postman when he comes this afternoon. If you take my advice, you'll make her a present of your boar, and you'll not be so much upset. She can have my goldfish, too, if she likes. Oh, excellent, excellent. Well, give her the goldfish. Then she really will have nothing in the world to complain of. My little boy goes away. But presently he returns... Father, have you written a letter to Dirty? Not yet, my boy. It's time enough. I shan't forget it. Father, I'm so fond of Dirty. She was certainly a dear little girl. Father, I'm also so fond of Una. We look at each other. This is no joke. Perhaps we'd better wait with a letter till tomorrow. Or perhaps it would be best if we talked to Dirty ourselves. We get back to town. Then my eyes surprise an indescribable smile on our mother's face. All a woman's incapacity to understand man's honesty is contained within that smile. And I resent it greatly. Come. Let's go. 
my little boy and I go out to a place we know of far away behind the hedge where we lie on our back and look up at the blue sky and talk together sensibly as two gentlemen should. My little boy is going to school. We can't keep him at home any longer, says his mother. He himself is glad to go, of course. Because he doesn't know what school is. I know what it is, and I know also that there is no escape for him, but I am sick at heart. So we go for our last morning walk along the road where something wonderful has always happened to us. We sit down by the edge of our usual ditch. And suddenly my heart triumphs over my understanding. I just want to tell you that school is a horrid place. You can have no conception of what you have to put up with there. They will tell you that two and two are four. Mother's taught me that already. Yes, but that is wrong. Two and two are never four. Only very seldom. And that's not all. You will never have any more time to play in the courtyard with Ina. When he shouts to you to come out, you'll have to sit and read about a lot of horrible old kings who've been dead for hundreds and hundreds of years, if they ever existed at all. Which, for my part, I simply don't believe. My little boy doesn't understand me. But he sees that I am sad. Puts his hand in mine. Mother says that you must go to school to become a clever boy. Mother says that Ina is ever so much too small and stupid to go to school. I bow my head. I nod and say nothing. I take him to school. See how he gallops up the steps without so much as turning to look back at me. Here ends this story about my little boy. What more can there be to tell? He's no longer mine. I have handed him over to society. There was nothing else to be done. Really? Was there nothing else to be done? I wonder. Small boys have a bad time of it, you know. They had a worse time of it in the old days. Mm, That's poor comfort. The world is still full of parents and teachers who shake their stupid heads and turn up their old eyes and cross their flat chests with horror at the wickedness of youth. Children are so disobedient, they say, so naughty, so self-willed, and talk so disrespectfully to their elders. And what do we do? We who know better... We do what we can. She says it in such a way and looks at me with two such sensible eyes. They're so strong and so true that I suddenly think things quite well for our little boy. And I become quiet and cheerful like herself. Those teachers of his better look out, though. My little boy, for all I care, may take from them all the English and geography and history that he can, but they shan't throw dust in his eyes about the important things. I shall keep him awake. And we shall have great fun finding them out. And I shall help him with his English and geography and history. Columbia Network has brought you Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air 
in dramatized versions of three famous short stories. I'm a Fool by Sherwood Anderson, The Open Window by H.H. H. Monroe, Saki, and My Little Boy by Carl Ewald. We now present the star and director of these broadcasts, Orson Welles. My little boy grew up to be a writer like his father, Carl Ewald. And according to Mr. Alexander Wolcott, who made widely known that indescribably lovely testament of love, my little boy has chiefly distinguished himself in Denmark as the translator of successful English novels, including The Green Hat. The second and somewhat sinister posy in this evening's children's garland was The Open Window by H.K. Monroe, who signed himself Saki. It has been said of Hector Monroe that he was entirely incapable of boring a fellow creature. It is, God knows, eternally true of Saki. Indeed, his sister's earliest recollections of him in the nursery where he and their brother Charlie had been rashly left to their own devices is worthy of his most improbable heroes. To quote from her, Hector had seized the long-handled hearthbrush plunged it into the fire and chased Charlie and me around the table, shouting, I am God, I am going to destroy the world. H.K. Monroe joined up at the beginning of the war and was killed by a sniper on the 14th of November, 1916, just before dawn. The author of our opening bill, that searching and poignant confession of a young lover who lied and lost, is this moment the editor of two newspapers in Marion, Virginia, one Democratic and the other Republican. This virtually perfect condition of life is the happy ending of a career that commenced surprisingly and suddenly one hot afternoon when Mr. Sherwood Anderson was the manager of a paint factory in Elyria, Ohio. He was sitting in his office, the story goes, dictating a letter. When he turned to his stenographer and said sharply, I am walking in the bed of a river. He then put on his hat and walked out of the paint factory and also out of Elyria, Ohio, never to return. But Sherwood Anderson never forsook his native state. Not really. After all, nothing could be more faithful to it than I'm a fool. Well, next week, Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre Till then, thanks, everybody, and good night.